you hear me okay, everyone? Can ever, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, thanks so much for uh, having me. And I'm going to talk today, my name's Pratichi, and I'm going to talk today about a little bit of research that came off the end of my PhD. Um, and that was located in the suburbs of Waterloo and Redfern in, in Sydney, in Australia. And I was doing field work there between 2015 and 2017. Uh, oh, one sec. I can't seem to take my slide down. Sorry, there we go. That's better. So I've marked the suburb of Waterloo and Redfern with um, in a circle there. They're suburbs that are not very far from the coast in Sydney. Um, and if you, what we have here is a map of um, Sydney and also of different parts of New South Wales, which demarcate the boundaries of different indigenous clans. Um, I'd like to um, acknowledge that um, my work was done on the land of the Gadigal clan, who are the traditional custodians of inner South Sydney, and that's where the suburbs of Waterloo and Redfern fall. Um, and I'd also like to pay respects to their um, elders, past and present. Um, and while British colonization in um, Australia began in 1788, um, I think it's important to recognize that um, Aboriginal people there never ceded their sovereignty. Uh, so the thoughts that I'll present to you today um, are not developed with um, Aboriginal um, communities in Sydney, but um, Aboriginal activists um, and um, academics um, and from the Redfern and Waterloo areas have very much influenced my thinking. The people like uh, Jenny Munro, um, Gary Foley, uh, Lorna Munro, um, and Joel Spring, especially. Um, and my work has also been influenced by some of the public housing tenants who um, I worked with and came across during my time um, in Sydney. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, so the suburbs of uh, Redfern and Waterloo, um, Redfern in particular, um, are important sites for um, urban Aboriginal communities. They're on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people um, who can trace their kinship systems and laws back to that place. But Aboriginal people with connections from other parts of Australia um, also call it home. And this reflects a situation of rural to urban migration, um, particularly in the 60s and 70s, um, prior to which Aboriginal people were very much excluded from urban areas, even though they continued to live there. And this migration um, was for economic reasons, for work, and sometimes to reconnect with family members who were separated from one another. Um, so, as I said, the suburbs, particularly Redfern, has a prominent um, history of activism. You can see signs there of some of the uh, community controlled services that were set up by um, Aboriginal communities. And I talk about Waterloo and Redfern together because. Um, the suburb because Aboriginal people live across both the suburbs and the community controlled organizations that they have um, are on the boundaries of the suburbs. Um, so you have the Aboriginal legal service, the medical service, um, the housing service um, company rather that was set up in the 60s and 70s by um, activists who are inspired by the Black Power movement and the ethos of self-help. So these community controlled organizations very much advocated a politics of self-determination. They were controlled by Aboriginal people and their services were for Aboriginal people. And many of those people who founded these services were also involved in the broader land rights movement. And you can see a banner um, from a demonstration, um, part, which is part of that broader land rights movement. Um, so currently, sorry, I'm having some trouble with my, um, there you go. So currently, um, the suburb of Waterloo is, is uh, gentrifying, um, and Aboriginal activism has been channeled into um, that into anti gentrification campaigns. This is a picture here of the Waterloo estate, uh, which is going to be redeveloped um, under government plans. It's an important source of um, housing for Aboriginal people and for low income people in that neighbourhood. And public housing here refers to government housing. It's subsidized by the government, so it's low cost um, affordable housing. And um, this 
sort of picture over here is of two towers, the Matavai and Taranga Towers of the Waterloo Estate, um, among the largest there. It has some quite amazing views of the Sydney skyline. And the estate itself has to over 2,000 dwellings. It's home to over 3,000 tenants. Um, under the government program, um, it will be demolished and replaced with a mix of uh, private housing, so up to 70% approximately will be private housing and 30% will be um, government subsidized social housing. Um, and this has caused um, a, a lot of community anxiety and also outrage. So the estate, as I said, um, is um, important for Aboriginal people. They make up um, a, a proportion of the tenant base and it allows them access to the community controlled organizations that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's also home to quite a diverse community. So 43% of tenants are born um, outside of Australia and there's a prominent Chinese, Russian and also Pacific Islander um, community over there. So it's, you know, it's a culturally diverse um, area. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this slide in the interest of time. But like the question that I've been thinking of really is, what work does multiculturalism do in colonial cities like Sydney? And I'm interested in like the impact of multicultural sort of inclusion in the context of consultation uh, processes that are run um, in redevelopments like the Waterloo um, estate. So the consultation process um, in Waterloo um, has been going for a number of years. It's still um, ongoing. And um, in an earlier phase of that consultation, which was run in 2017 um, and 2018, uh, it was called the visioning phase. And it had a series of activities aimed to understand a tenant's views um, and their aspirations about the future of the redevelopment. Uh, the themes uh, covered things like what they wanted culture and community life to look like, what they wanted the housing and neighborhood design to look like, um, what they wanted from um, the environment uh, in the area. And I think over 1,500 people um, were sort of engaged in this consultation. Now, while it sounds quite um, progressive, I think it's important to remember that um, consultation does not mean decision making many important decisions had or about the redevelopment of this estate had been made before um, public consultation. So decisions like the privatization of land and the introduction of mainly private housing in the new, in the new redevelopment, those decisions uh, were not influenced and cannot be influenced by tenants. And there's no legal obligation for the government to listen to tenants um, through this, con uh, what tenants say in this consultation. I'm gonna skip over that slide as well. Um, so it's not really that progressive. Now, this is a uh, sort of page from a consultant report, um, which is done for the government. Uh, they hired a consultant to manage the community consultation, and it lists all of the different activities um, that were going on. Um, there were things like surveys and workshops where tenants were asked questions about what they wanted from the redevelopment. Um, you can see over here at number five, that's the Aboriginal flag, and this signifies the um, consultation activities that were directed at Aboriginal tenants and community members. And over here at number seven, you can see this acronym CALD, and that means culturally and linguistically diverse, and that signifies um, the consultation activities like workshops um, that were specifically directed at um, people from non-English speaking backgrounds. So um, migrant communities to Australia who are generally not white or they're not from Anglo countries. Um, so this Aboriginal engagement stream um, was basically um, intended to, um, to ensure culturally sensitive and um, an appropriate approach um, to consultation. Um, and there was a specialist strategy, uh, Aboriginal owned design and strategy group uh, who facilitated community workshops. And they worked with many of the Aboriginal organizations in the area. Um, they, what they did was they adopt, adapted the mainstream consultation um, to ensure that it was culturally appropriate and wasn't offensive. And the idea to, uh, behind these sort of separate sessions for 
uh, Aboriginal tenants was to ensure that their voices were heard and that knowledge um, was captured. Um, the content of the Aboriginal um, consultation, however, was not that dissimilar. It was the same as many of the other consultation sessions. Um, they, they also hired an Aboriginal liaison officer um, to support the participation of Aboriginal tenants. Um, this was a demand made by Jenny Munro, who's a Wiradjuri um, activist in Redfern and Waterloo, and the role is an important one. The main responsibility was to ensure that um, um, Aboriginal tenants were receiving the right advice, uh, that they were informed about the project, and that there was space for them to have their views heard. Um, Alongside this um, sort of encouraging um, uh, or trying to support Aboriginal participation, the government also had a similar set of activities uh, for people um, from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. So it had separate sessions that were organized for tenants, um, including workshops for Cantonese, Mandarin and Russian speakers. Um, it's hired uh, two bilingual um, educators um, to support Chinese and Russian tenants in order to, um, you know, so that they could receive information in their native language and so that they could uh, discuss the redevelopment uh, in their native language. And the quote here on the right just talks about the importance of these roles, uh, but they were defunded uh, last year in 2020. Um, so I guess my question is, what is this sort of participation actually doing? Um, I guess the recognition of difference is quite, has been um, an important component of it, but we have to remember that um, the consultation didn't actually allow tenants to have much influence. Um, so there's a question that it, I found the consultation process quite problematic in a way. And I think Libby Porter's work on planning is quite insightful here. Um, she claims that there's an inherent conceit to the right to participation in planning processes that we see in Waterloo. As the quote indicates, there's a tendency to eliminate a fundamental politics from such participatory processes. So in a settler colonial city like Sydney, the social field, um, and that is the the field of Aboriginal dispossession, of colonization, um, in which planning has played an important role, that inherently political social field is not actually accounted for. None of the sessions um, that formed the consultation included questions about land or about sovereignty, um, even the ones that were run for Aboriginal tenants. Um, Yellow Knives Dene um, academic Glenn Coulthard um, claims that a politics of recognition means that colonial governments attempt to recognize um, indigenous sovereignty on the terms of the colonizers as opposed to the terms of in Aboriginal people. But in contrast to uh, Coulthard's case, what in redevelopment context, in urban redevelopment context like Waterloo, that recognition is even more superficial. No effort was made to recognize Aboriginal sovereignty. Um, and so what is really happening is really a politics of non-recognition. And I guess what I'm interested in is what techniques are involved in removing the political content of planning, um, as Libby Porter puts it. Um, I guess I'm really interested in how that non-recognition um, takes place. And I get, I see um, the, a, a very narrow form of multiculturalism in planning as an important technique by which um, that non-recognition is enacted. And this is not an argument against cultural diversity and embracing that, um, but rather it expresses a problem with the, the limited way um, in which it is. Uh, two minutes, okay, I suppose, cool, thanks, Matthew. Um, so over here, you have pictures of um, two um, sets of activities. On the left is a calendar from a community room on the Waterloo Public Housing Estate. Um, I don't think you can see it, but it basically lists different um, consultation activities. Um, there's one for Aboriginal tenants, there's one for Chinese tenants, one for Russian tenants. And then over here uh, on the right, you have a timetable from a community newsletter that was handed out to tenants. And again, this was for another part of the redevelopment. Uh, what you have here is it lists the workshops, again, for Chinese, Russian, and Aboriginal residents. 
And I think this actually um, represents quite well a broader problem with the way in which cultural diversity um, is being read, where um, the categorization of Aboriginal people and non-English speaking um, settler communities, that categorization is sort of under a, the same rubric. They're both seen as diverse stakeholders. And I think that reveals a lack of acknowledgement of Australia's colonial context and questions of Aboriginal sovereignty and self-determination. The consultation sessions, the activities, were not that different for all of the different for the different groups. Um, they focused on the same kinds of themes of housing, community facilities, and nobody had any real influence over the project. Um, and even though this was important to do to provide a platform for uh, voices that might otherwise have been marginalized, um, the recognition of cultural diversity, I think, also uh, positions Aboriginal communities as part of a broader multicultural whole. And their difference is seen as qualitatively equal to that of other ethnically diverse stakeholders. Um, so I think the, um, a quote from Eileen Morton Robinson, who's a Gunnapal um, academic, um, reveals um, something, uh, provides food for thought. When she says that such a politics of multiculturalism that is practiced in Australia or um, promoted by certain Australian politicians it really reduces Aboriginal people to one culture amongst many, another like a cultural tributary. And as that is a problem because it doesn't see them as people who are making claims of self-determination of land and of sovereignty. Um, they, are, they are one part of a broader whole and it's taking the politics um, out, the politics of colonization out of um, planning in this case. Um, and that's something I'm thinking about more. Um, so uh, I'll leave you uh, with that. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to stop sharing now. Cool. Thank you so much, Pratichi, for a thought-provoking presentation. <clears throat> I think there's a lot of parallels with Chile, but we'll talk okay, about that I... later. Um, Eliseo, adelante. Eliseo, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I just wanted to check if you can hear me. Great. I'm going to share my screen. My presentation is regarding the public architecture and the indigenous people in Chile in the Mapuche context as a part of the experiences and lessons learned that I have had as an observer, as a public worker. And I have been linked in different moments in the work of design architectural design guides for indigenous people or in territories of indigenous people somehow what i want to share are some reflections and proposals that come from this participation and they make me question what are the elements for a new public architecture after 20 years where they have been having a type of architecture, public architecture, where they build public spaces like schools, uh, schools, hospitals, and cultural spaces, and also jails and police station. How and what are the elements? of uh, public architecture with uh, an indigenous people context and focus. The, we have to understand the public architecture as a physical support and symbol of the human development. Also, we have to understand the phenomena of the symbolic appropriation and 
effective of the public space, also the capacity of the public architecture of contributing to the construction of identity. So in this seminar, I added this like kind of question. This culture, public architecture, could it be intercultural? Could we understand that's plurinational? In this architecture, could it be decommunizing? This is not answered. This is a reflection that we should develop. What I speak about in this presentation is about the focus that the state has nowadays to understand what is the appropriate way to build public buildings in indigenous people's land or that are for their development. I wanted to say that the Department of Architecture made a change in the definition of what is public building. Any public work is the equipment built by the state that includes building and public spaces for providing services to the community and to promote and territorial equity in the common goods and the development of humans. These services of public works have five points, social development and economic development, public identity, habitability and functionality, security, resilience, and sustainability. These allow us to find a formula to administrate these public buildings or works in an appropriate way and to make them intercultural and plurinational and a decolonizing building. This public entity is a symbolic thing in this development and it has a dual like sense or meaning because we understand it, that this dual function represents the action of the state and it also represents and gathers the definition of the lifestyles of the local communities. And here we have to think about what kind of states is thinking about this and what are the local communities coming back to what I was saying as the experience that I observed. This is one that started in the 2000s with this architectonic design guide. These guides were updated in 2016 and has allowed to develop different type of buildings that have the challenge this guide have the challenge that the architect can recognize the elements that are from the indigenous communities. In this case, Mapuche and Aymara. In 2020, they published the guides to, to architecture and design for other indigenous people, Kawaskar, Sangnam, Yagan, among others. These guides are structured in three parts. One that has to be with the approximation to the world view of the indigenous people. Some references, so of good practices or referential cases and an orientation of architectonic design that can be applied through different aspects, materials, characteristic animal um, characteristic 
aspects also along with what I said in the beginning, what it has been established by the guys it are some principles. And these principles are some kind of advance in this state structure to recognize some elements that maybe they still require a reflection and a deeper development. We can recognize as a principle the interculturality, the participation, the flexibility, that it's like a wake up call to administrate and analyze the processes, the complementarity, understanding that there are elements that come from the dominant culture, that is the state culture and the local cultures as the ones from indigenous people. Also the whiteness and the movement, maybe we could say the cosmic characteristic of the architecture, thinking about their indigenous people philosophy and also the sustainability having this link with the environment. When we developed this in the 2000s, we had as a reference some projects that are symbolic that were already built, were built at the late 20th century. This is a museum, Mapuche Museum, that it's in Cañete, that was developed by the Department of Architecture. This is the Institute of Indigenous Studies of Temuco that was built in 94 and the training center of indigenous people in Villarrica. And this had the characteristic of being like public buildings and had the intention of integrating elements of the Mapuche people in this case. When in 2000, when these design guides start, the need of the Mapuche people was that the public building will cover some needs with services like schools, hospitals that didn't consider the elements of the Mapuche culture. So this architecture keeps some elements that we could name public buildings, but from the perspective of the space of the collective where we have cemeteries, fields, to have as a reference of this type of buildings. In the first experiences that we develop, we had schools that were the main space where we could try this link with this design guides, mixing elements that come from the local culture, ancestral culture, and with the needs of having this service of education structured by the state for the communities. Another case are the different size of the school. And then we have these cultural centers. That's the experience that the Department of Architecture had and with which I try to present a question of understanding this public architecture as a physical support and symbol of the human development. According to Fernando Carrion, the public spaces is is our, our representation of the collective life and also the it defines it we should understand the public space as a pedagogy space to allow the meeting 
of heterogenic manifestation. I speak about this from experiences, like one of the first cases that we had is the intercultural village of Trawupeyim. We had some conditions here. This is an urban space of not that much population where the link with the rural context is very close. So here we can have a mix of different elements of use, culture, where the Mapuche community is very linked to the urban space. So from a very special work that didn't follow the normal processes, we could have a participation process of the community. The community was fighting to have this kind of roof. For us, it was very hard because it had technical challenges to build it and maintain it, but it was an element that to the community made sense. So it could be a symbol of the building. And here we have traditional elements like a um, ceremonial space, the use of fire in a public building that was modern or that was built in the city. In two more minutes, okay. What we have to keep in mind is that we should keep in mind that behind this concept of development, we have some not that objective perspective in the Mapuche world. We talk about the well living and a concept of what is being Mapuche and other concepts. Another element is the uh, impact of the symbolic appropriation. To create their own experiences. This hospital is an emblematic case, symbolic case, because in this structure, a structure was added to provide a natural medicine space. And a third element is the capacity of the public architecture to contribute to the construction of this indigenous ethno-cultural identity. In Santiago, we can see somehow how this was developed in an autonomous way in different municipalities. We also have these Hogar de Estudiantes Indígenas that started in 99, and then in 2003 with different houses. And in 2012, they created a building that started being built in 2016, and that was a space of re-elaboration, identity re-elaboration of students. And this creates a speech in the use and the space. So just to finish, and as a proposal of this presentation, we have to consider the importance of these buildings as a built infrastructure and also about the process because the process is very important because it's not enough for the state to have criteria or a to-do list to have results, but we also have to see the process and how this is integrated.
with the values and the limits of the participation and among other elements. From the indigenous call, this is to consider these public spaces. And today, with the education of more students, more indigenous students as our architects, as planners of spaces, they can have more options. So this can be implemented and not in a vertical relationship and not as a provider of services that it's from outside the culture, but rather they are in the culture, within the culture. So who we consider Mapuche and there are in, in the public system, they can be mediators in all ways of lives in this totalitarian concept of the Mapuche vision. We The challenge that we have is that that we educate, we get education in a colonial way in university. So us as architect, we have this challenge of reinterpreting these indigenous experiences. I think that's what we have to change. We have to regenerate this link between these two aspects. Thank you, Matthew. No, muchas gracias a usted, Elisabeth, no, thank you. La, la tan for completa. your presentation. Pas in a short las preguntas time. Un poquito más. Pasamos we leave the question a Gonzalo Rodríguez a su presentación. for later. Gonzalo? Sí, ahí veo. Bien. Hola, buenos días a todos. Eh, quiero, quiero agradecer la invitación a participar en este seminario de recolonización. I want to thank the uh, invitation for participating in this session for having me. And this presentation talks about how modern architecture has some traces of colonial semanticity. We're going to check the case of the standard schools in La Daltania from the perspective of a educational reform. First, we have the process of certification in La Daltania a uh, successful, let's say, occupation from the perspective of the government to have the sovereignty over a land. But this fails in the process of generating an identity. The second history is one of the president that was known for creating Carabineros de Chile, the Chilean police. And he saw in the Italian fascism the key of creating a new Chile. And we also have the presence of a third theory, that is a union of teachers that were looking for improving the education and changing the old models, aiming for radical changes. So we will see these three stories intertwine. First, from the ones about the teachers, as you can see, they had some concerns. They were talking about school from the perspective of architecture that didn't imply lessons 
but they were talking about different activities and going out of the school, not being there, confined, stuck in that world. But if we're going to talk about the trees, let's not talk about them from the classroom, but let's go and see the trees. So this initiative that you can see there, the credits in the image, this was part of was used in 1928 from the head of the department school for the parents. So this is an axis of the new school in Chile, and it's part of a very intense journey that we can divide in five acts. It starts in 1923, a series of teachers of, uh, poorly paid and upset with the pedagogy in that, at that time. And they organized, they start this second act, uh, third act, sorry, revolution. And they ask for funds and they get the funds. And then there's agreement with Carlos Ibañez del Campo, a former president. And the teachers of this union supported him and in exchange, he would support this educational reform. And he, he does it, actually. It's, we have a new law in 1928 with this notion of the new school. Uh, the sad part of this is uh, next year, this law was uh, denied, and then there was a feeling of a hybrid model that we will be checking now. So here we have a timeline, so we are all considering the time. So all of this situation starts here in the middle part among 1920s and 1925. We had two big uh, big events concerning education. The first one was making primary schools compulsory. And this is important because in terms of architecture, it's, we have the second big uh, fact, the second big event, that is the creation of a society regarding education. Now we're going to talk about Carlos Ibañez del Campo, he was this president that was a big fan of Mussolini and Italian fascism. And he managed a lot of links with uh, North American countries to create this new Chile, this modern Chile that looked for manifesting this modernity through different aspects. We have here the cover of a magazine, Chile magazine in 1927, and we had this uh, visual, this visual elements that were promoting different ac commercial economic activities. Here we have three portraits in the book that Chile presents in a fair, an Ibero-American fair, and they place Carlo Ibañez del Campo next to the King Alfonso XIII and another president that was one of Carlos Ibañez del Campo reference. Then in 1928, the American president visits Chile. He does a tour in Latin America, and he visits Chile for a quite long period. This visit allows us to understand something we can see here in this magazine, that is um, architecture and decorative arts, how um, American architects arrived to the country to build 601 
schools. It was one, it was part of the modernization plan of Carlos Ibañez del Campo that we didn't have until that moment. And we get once again to our first history regarding this theft that was pending to create an identity in La Araucanía after the pacification. So this starts in the Carlos Ibañez del Campo government. The image, the picture in the center is the one that was also part of this book for the fair in Sevilla. So we start adding the indigenous visuals to our national identity. We can also see pictures of different labor, different works that we can see in these pictures. And we see an indigenous people being part of this idea of the country. In the same exposition, we also see the government trying to incorporate indigenous motives. So something like an Aboriginal identity built in this Chilean identity. So if we go back to the initial idea, we had this three big uh, works, this modernity without an identity, this educative identity as well. So standard schools are born apparently with a colonial perspective. This is part of a, a research that we're currently working on. This is an ongoing project. I'm just sharing what we have discovered until now. And here we see that regarding education, there was the opportunity to build an identity before Carlos Ibañez del Campo. The physical education class was very important and it looked for these values of order, uniformity, discipline, uh, values that are part of a modern society. And that it was very questioned as well. Uh, there was a, a, a German professor, a German teacher on physical education that was also imposing its own model. There was the intention also of bringing a Swedish model. And there were some uh, struggles inside the Congress because they were asking for our own model. So if they were asking themselves if a Mapuche model or a Chilean model will be more proper, more appropriate than importing models, these discipline models that are looking to emulate a military formation in children, and that it starts to be developed with Alessandri and Carlos Ibañez del Campo, and later with Pedro Aguirre Cerda, creating the defense department. And in the end, we have these two pictures, one of a physical education class from the third rate, and one in Chile in 1943. And we can see how they copy the models and um, this copy of certain languages and codes what we have these ideas of modernity that are uh, so like totalitarian models in La Araucanía we can see it uh, with the construction the building of these standard schools so we have a guide after 100 years it is from 1931. And very proudly, they were announcing the building of three standard schools in Temuco that will have all of these amenities and all the conditions that were part of the modern education. 
that's when we see this Iranian period that these schools appear. And it is important because we have this idea of an efficient state, effective state, and this is uh, a background for what was later visualized as the paradigm for the Tilian schools. But before this happened, the experience that we're seeing in Temuco, in La Raucanía, in these three schools, that uh, does the comment, the structures are still there. One of them is what was later the Liceo Presidente Nivel Pinto. Um, this was paid by the foundation company. That this was this group that came with Hoover's visit to Chile. It's a very simple, let's say, structure that uses a language with concepts that are looking for this Chilean lab. The characteristics of being Chilean that included some aspects of the Mapuche culture. Since Ar Arcilla, they were seen as something very Spartan, considering rigor, discipline. We can see now any these schools that are still there. One of them is now Universidad La Frontera, the building. And this could also talk about a new colonization. We first had the, um, the pacification, right? And then with architecture, we can see a second wave of this new colonization through architecture with a very imposed modernity. That we also have some other examples from 1932 different examples of these codes that are very rigid. Oh, we can see new materials as well. We can see gyms with roofs for making physical education. And in later presidential governments, we have a superior school of boys and girls. They maintain these codes. and that we already saw the first expression later. From this, we have many different questions regarding semanticity. There are some things that we can also connect with Eliseo's presentation, and we could also contrast this more contemporary expression that to what happened in the 30s, 1930s. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Gonzalo. El tiempo estuvo muy bien controlado. Thank you very much, eh, Gonzalo. Very ahora good. Ahora pasamos a un, a un tiempo para preguntas entre los, Let's go now los to exponentes. This &A, so eh, you can ask each other questions. Tengo, yo tengo preguntas, pero quizá primero si, si questions, tienen preguntas entre si alguien quiere preguntar a otro exponente. Ask yourselves questions. Gonzalo, can you please turn mm -hmm. your camera on so it's easier, the dialogue? I, I have a question. Um, yeah. Um, so it's mainly for Alicia. Um, so I really um, enjoyed your presentation. And I think at the end you said, um, it's not enough to just have the output. There should be good process. Um, and I guess, um, and you talked about there were more um, uh, indigenous students studying architecture. And so you can have people within the community uh, who can actually design and be part of creating um, architecture that is um, aligned with um, philosophy, with say Mapuche philosophy. And I was wondering whether there are examples um, that you have of good good process. Um, 
Uh, and yeah, and what you mean by that, by the process being important as well. Yeah, sorry, I don't, yeah, I don't speak any um, Spanish. Yeah. Um, muchas gracias, Pratichi. Thank you very much, Pratichi, for your question. Well, in fact, we have an experience from the architecture group that I'm part of. Um, from that experience, I, I mentioned this while I prepare my presentation. I think all of them are food processes as long as they have participation of the community. Of course, we have some processes that are more participatory than others. And I would say that we also have processes with good practices, especially in two cases. One, thinking of the process that could involve a work that is slow with interaction of the community. This allows the building to actually be able to comply with their function in a way that is more efficient. For example, if it's a school or a cultural center, in the case of cultural topics, there is also space where we have a lot of possibilities. In the case of a school, it's going to depend a lot also on the educational program of the school and how they are involved so it's not only about just architecture architecture only is an answer to some of these things and the example i was mentioning is a good example in curarewe because most of the students are pewente the school that had to be renovated because it was very old so they build it again. It was a school where they held Mapuche ceremonies, such as the celebration of New Year, Mapuche New Year, and they also had Mapungun lessons. So the school had to be in order to comply with those ceremonials. Some other examples that are not so good are the ones where architecture is it goes beyond than the service and how to develop the service itself. Here, um, I give you an example, like an extreme example. We also modify policy building and there, there is no logic understanding in how is justice and security from a Mapuche perspective, there's nothing of that. So in those cases, architecture won't be able to do something. And if it does, it's going to be like an accessory and meaningless. So the two examples allow us to visualize the situation of the of architecture when we are treating with an Arctic, um, sorry, intercultural relation. And I, I also take the chance to tell you what you were saying about the consultation processes. And in fact, consultation processes are interesting elements and important for me. But I also think that we should recognize, and that's my question for you, we should recognize somehow that these consultation processes create our relationships. And these are our resource that it's, let's say, to save a gap of lack of democracy, lack of effective participation of uh, people in the state. So to my view, participation itself, it's something completely needed, but we cannot understand it if we don't think of the basic structure of participation. For example, the concept of a plurinational state that we understand as compound of different nations, of course, the participation there is going to be much more useful 
than a participation from a state that is colonial or that it considers that they have to take progress to these people, that they see them as underdeveloped, let's say. So in the case of cities, it's much more complex, as you were saying, when we have multiculturalism. So there I wanted to ask you, if is it possible for you or which are the elements of a consultation process? Which are these elements that we could take into account into these processes to make them better in a city as the one you showed to us? No, uh, thank you uh, for your response. And the question that you asked is, it's a difficult um, question um, in cities like um, Sydney. And I don't, I'm trying to think how, you know, how that okay. consultation could be done differently, right? Um, or what really is the important part of it um, that, you know, that we need to redesign in a, in a colonial city where the government is a colonial government. Um, and I guess there are, a there are a couple of different things. Um, one is, if the question is about, you know, in, in, in sort of um, in Sydney and with the um, Aboriginal communities there, if the question is about sovereignty um, and about land rights, and that's very important to people there, then I guess it's a problem when a government is starting the process. And I, the government in Waterloo, for instance, they are the property owners of that site. They own the land. And in in cities like Sydney, generally it is the property owner um, of land who has influence over the consultation process. They always have more power. And I guess if we can separate the property ownership from the consultation and planning, I think that would go, in my view, a long way towards creating a fairer consultation process, because then um, the, say, tenants in Waterloo, the Aboriginal tenants, they they wouldn't be seen as people who are renting on this land who don't own the land and so they have no you know they don't have the rights of a landowner but if we start saying that no the consultation process can't be dominated by the landowner in this case by the state then i think that would go um, a long way to making a difference but i guess the second thing is and it's come up in the last session um as well where um, Aboriginal relations with uh, with land, including urban land in cities like Sydney, there isn't a proper um, there isn't a proper way of um, sort of acknowledging that. So there are various pieces of legislation that um, try and recognise land rights um, in Australia, but they're not very good for cities. Um, and I don't want to go into the details of that, but like there's the native title and there's the Aboriginal Land Rights Act. Um, and they haven't been very effective in allowing Aboriginal people to claim land in cities and to transform cities into Aboriginal spaces. So I think in cities, we need to rethink like what relationships with land we, uh, we give importance to and think about what legislation can you know can do to recognize that but that's a really complicated thing and aboriginal people have to be at the forefront of that but that's not an easy thing sorry i don't know if i answered your question but sí. yeah sí, gracias. yeah thank you very much thank, thank you Pratichi. um el pablo fuentes, pablo eh, fuentes está en la sala y quiere hacer una pregunta para el deseo I guess he's in the room and he wants to make a question for Eliseo. Yeah, hi Eliseo. Hi to all the speakers. Congratulations for your presentations. Thank you, Gonzalo, Rodrigo, to speak about Araucanía, which is a very complex situation. And my question is for Eliseo. First, 
I want to thank you for your work because this is, I have the impression that this is changing this architectonic language and it opens doors for an architecture and for a region that is has a lot of potential. When you look at the architecture and the possible inf potential influence and the, of Mapuche in this architectonic language, I see it as two periods in a time like where the book of Gutierrez, where he wanted to do like some guides and drawings to put it on the buildings. And then you jump from that time where you were looking for appropriation, like cultural appropriation, then you jump to the 70s with the construction of the Cañete Museum, where it opens again a door. And since I'm not, I don't have much knowledge in this, I wanted to know in this period, between this period, if you can differentiate some risings of the Mapuche culture. We are in an investigation and we're trying to discover in the 40s and 60s, 70s, we're investigating if there are examples where the culture has infiltrated in the architecture. Yeah, thank you, Pablo. I wanted to take the chance to tell you that the presentation of Gonzalo is very interesting. And I think there is an element that can answer your question from the observation in 1930, we have the influence of a movement and what happened in Chile, it was a process of recovery or reappearance of the popular forces. We have the Frente Popular and that got Pedro Aguirre Cerda elected as a president during that time. We had the period of Ibáñez. We have a very interesting process. And culturally, one of the first main things that happened in architecture is that in the public aspect, we start looking for identity and we start valorating this. And this is linked to the neoclassicism that was during this time in 1920, everything had to be neoclassic, like the justice buildings. So we start having these expression spaces and we have Kuchaski, who is a very good reference, Cortez, Gonzalo, Ricardo Cortez also. They are the ones that start building, that built this work phase, work force buildings. And in some of the decorations, you start having some indigenous elements like the furniture that you show. So there you have a reflection of the construction of identity at a national level that starts searching for indigenous uh, sources and elements. That's not new. I think that since the foundation of started when Carrera brothers started creating a emblematic symbol of the country with two Mapuche elements, that's where you start seeing this search for identity. This has always been in a relationship like we were talking in the morning, like Lucas said, of taking this indigenous aspect as something from the past, like an epic uh, story. And it's very useful for us to understand our own story and elements, but we leave behind the people that are still living, the native people. <laughs> 
and we don't build a culture to free, make them free and make their elements free. But we use them as like a, in a past tense, not to unify ourselves, which is very difficult. And that started marking the, the paths that we followed of what it is and what is not. So with this creation of this institutional identity, we can have it at different levels. Um, Regarding that, I think it can also happen from the indigenous perspective, Mapuche specifically, that we can generate. And I think it happens that you start creating icons and it's understandable and it's even needed in some points because you need to give context to some aspects. The idea of the circularity in architecture that is part of the projects that try to be indigenous. They create a, a space that is on a semicircle because this identifies the Mapuche elements because it allows the dialogue of the interculturality. That could be a two way weapon because you, it's built in just one way and that it's when it's important to understand that many young people that maybe are going to overcome us and be bigger than us are going to be maybe architects and they will create buildings that maybe are not, spe not specifically of the circular element that we had in some buildings. I'm thinking now about the Mapuche rappers that are rapping in their native language. And this is a contraction of new worlds to say so. And maybe that's where we are going. And we have to recognize that this dynamism and this construction has been permanent. When you have these standard schools, that is something that you maybe can research in the communities that were being pushed away from the schools, they started creating their own schools. In the community of my father, people started to gather materials and they created and built the first school and is the Crosetto school. And it's little, but they needed that school. Just as the government started creating these huge schools and they had way more fountains for that. They had materials and it wasn't so complicated as now. They just thought about it and built one school. When you, when your own sources start creating something in an autonomous way, you create a community space and a public building. And there is another case with this that reflects what the Mapuche people lived permanently. The Mapuche people won't want to be left behind and they start acting for themselves. The propia and those schools that they created were to learn Spanish and to be able to emerge in this context that was very oppressive. And that was a future with a city that was in Spanish. So they needed this school. Thank you, Eliseo. Yeah, I wanted to ask something. Would it be yes. possible? Sí, sí, Gonzalo, adelante. Yeah, Gonzalo. For Eliseo, I wanted to ask you about your final reflection or conclusion. You said that it's 
needed to change the paradigm of the interpretation or something like that? With the idea of rebuilding this link with the ancestral aspect. This is a reflection that comes, emerges from how we see this as a, from the architectonic aspects, the cultures and the heritage, the case where we work in this is a in reinterpretation, modern reinterpretation, because it is considered that the modernity has a series of different valid aspects and so to have a value, you have to reinterpret the elements. So the only validated thing is the modern perspective. So we add these elements from the past as an accessory. This points to block this reinterpretation as a mechanism especially in education, in school. One alternative path is the regeneration. And how can I create an architecture that regenerates the ways of seeing the world? In the Mapuche case, they have a philosophy. They have an understanding of being nature, so that's universal. And we cannot, when you say, let's reinterpret this contemporarily in some way, you are leaving it in a second um, aspect. If you regenerate, if you want to put value, you do this regeneration instead of this reinterpretation. So you say there is a, very subtle difference. That's interesting. Thank you very much. I have one question for Eliseo. And one question that I've been carrying from 2003. I was finishing my architecture studies in that time, and I got to know about this uh, design, gu design guides in 2003. And my question is, we are already in 2021. And you see that this phenomena of the architecture and this cultural appropriation and the building of identity that start with the visual aspect and try to limit it to the visual aspect. We see it with the incorporation of these elements. Now in modern buildings, you have like the hospital in Las Casas. It's a normal hospital and just has some stickers with Mapuche designs and it already became uh, Mapuche. And the question that I want to make you is that hasn't it be too much time, hasn't it passed too much time to just keep these, these architecture reference to just like this circular aspect that you spoke about, or this like a stickers, like I said, or just drawing some symbols and the rest of the building being more of the same thing. How do you see it in that sense? Thinking about from a perspective of the state and how the state has this responsibility of being inclusive and create an identity in respect of the culture. But in reality, we just see a reinterpretation or an implementation of some elements of these guides that do not represent in reality this Mapuche culture, do you see if they have achieved the, the purpose of the guide? The guide in the beginning was necessary, but now that it has been 15 years, do you think that 
it is important to do like an update or a change and give up these stereotypes, iconographic stereotypes of the culture and take it to what you present to go back to what is ancestral and to the depth of what's the culture. If we free ourselves of these stereotypes, maybe we could access to these um, cultural background aspect. It's very good. Your vision, you are talking about 20 years. And when the guides start, they start when we were speaking here of a new way of treating the indigenous people. After the 2000s, we were starting to really recognize the indigenous people. And I think that these exercises have to evolve and they have to be more developed. They are being stuck because when you take it to an, an area where it doesn't have any other development in like in the services, uh, like in a hospital that is going to, put, for example, just give the same services that is that are not going to add this Mapuche medicine or in a school that is not going to taught anything Mapuche related or in terms of the police station or justice buildings where you are going to have the same uh, system as before and not some Mapuche orientated a structure it's like you say these are just stickers like just like mapuche design stickers that you just put in that don't have like a profound change or orientation to the native people so we have to try to have that these services that are provided are plurinational and there are different in the different territories and there are complementary and architecture can reflect that also so regarding the architecture, then that also will change. If you have this big whole change, there is another thing that I think that it should work in is watching how the Mapuche economy is evolving. It now, now the Mapuche economy is very poor and it's very limited. So in the future, if we had like a Mapuche society that wasn't in poverty and wasn't mar marginalized, then maybe we could have Mapuche ex expressions in architecture, art, uh, that are more diverse and expanded. And with that iconographic compilation that is broader because it's a culture that is expressing itself. But in the symbolic aspect, we can, we have to think that there is something that is permanent and it's essential. And that symbolic lecture reading is something that will always have a need. The circular aspect in the Mapuche culture has a meaning that is related to some deeper aspect and will not change. The thing is how each one interprets them. If I'm going to do some Christian architecture, and this will be done in in a flower pots, for example, this means that I'm not understanding anything about this symbolism. When you offer what we have done in the architecture department that is giving you like a compilation of these elements, there are people that are not going to understand it. When we re-edited the guide, we did like a warning chapter. So you could have these considerations. So you could have like a good reading of this guide. But when I give the answer to Pratichi, there are bad cases 
where the service doesn't change and you try to make it Mapuche just in the superficial aspect. So you are looking at the architecture in a very limited way in that sense. It's very good your reflection, that needed reflection, Gonzalo. And I think that these seminars, the title for me, it's the main thing, decolonizing. That's the, the main aspect and how we, we manage these instruments or these tools. These tools are not prescriptive. They're just like a support guide. We have to think about how we treat and manage and how they operate in the public sector the services and how the projects are created. They have very few amount of participation from the local people. So we have to try to work with a very rigid ideology that was already there like in some places where you have a last minute request of for the architects to help. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias eh, a Thank todos. Hay, hay claramente hay mucho interés en seguir preguntando, pero queremos también limitar los tiempos de la the question going, de, but de seminario por la traducción. We have to keep um, track of the time vamos a, because of a cerrar. Bueno, we recordar que tenemos una mesa de discusión interna we'll que no se proyecta en YouTube. Esto es solamente para ustedes que están acá en la sala. It will be just for the, eh, Eliseo, Pratici, the ones Gonzalo, that are Pablo, in the Janina, Lucas, room, Gonzalo, Pratici, Gonzalo, eh, Lucas, otros, Eliseo, eh, and all the ones that are having spoken before. It's at 5 p.m. Chilean time, so if you can join, estos temas. you can me, me, me come me and keep the discussion para, among you. Perdona, que tengo el inglés en el oído. Um, entonces, el, eh, solamente para cerrar un poco la mesa, eh, yo creo que lo que dijo el deseo es fundamental, que es, es el I título, ¿no es cierto? Es, es, es esta búsqueda de, de la descolonización, de colonización. Eh, el, el, creo que las tres ponencias hablan mucho de la identidad, del poder, y de lo, del soporte físico, tanto de la arquitectura como de la tierra. Of the architecture en, en, and más en el caso de la Pratici, ¿no es cierto? Entonces estas tres in cosas están Pratici, realmente example, como so a, algunos, things, ¿cierto? Que esa fue más un poco la, la Pratici habló, es, están en pugna, ¿cierto? Es, es, son políticos y, y eso es, eh, in, en el fondo esto se expresa en la arquitectura, ya sea en puesta, como de forma colonial, alguna, un reconocimiento eh, mínimo, o en las formas, or en los muebles, Posición de recognition Sevilla, o un intento de recoger las formas con, de alguna forma un poco más eh, trial, un poco más holística, un poco más eh, respetuosa, como en el caso de, de la guía, de algunos de estos edificios, como dice, like en dice, in the dice guide, Eliseo, no son todos. Eh, like Eliseo says, y eh, en el caso de la, buildings, de, de la consulta, ¿cierto? También está, es, es, es un, also in terms un proceso of the eh, que, this que, is also político que, que se ve como una especie de reconocimiento donde eh, también un, un tema somehow, interesante like como lo, los pueblos indígenas se, se pierden element, en el multiculturalismo, ¿cierto? Este mar multicultural, creo que Chile todavía no llega a ese mismo nivel que tiene en Australia, el multiculturalismo es muy Chile, fuerte. Muy, hay mucha, Chile no tiene esta inmigración y pareciera que van yet, quedando como más eh, como un starting, público más dentro de los chinos, los rusos, etc. Eh, eso, así que... Ok. Ok, oh, thanks. <laughs> Groups, <laughs> ok. <laughs> sí, parece que mi hijo yeah. ganó un, un partido My de algo. No sé de qué. Eh, eso, así que... What. 
Eso, los so, dejamos invitados a la mesa de la tarde. We eh, invite you for ah, the perdón, round table perdón, también me, me avisan por eterno, también, perdón. Eh, también a todos, ¿cierto? Tanto en redes como, como en sí, YouTube, en Facebook, como en acá en la mesa. YouTube, eh, tenemos una mesa a las 3, 3 de la tarde, una mesa testimonial. Entonces tenemos tres exponentes de pueblos originarios eh, haciendo trabajo de recuperación identitario, ¿cierto? De prácticas en ciudades. Janina, que, que es nuestra estudiante del MAPRO, ¿cierto? Janina. Eh, no, Leslie student. Campbell, creo que es el nombre Leslie de Campbell. Victoria, I ¿cierto? British, en British Columbia en Canadá. Y From British eh, Columbia. no me acuerdo los nombres, creo que es Mikmash o Squamish. No, no tengo, ahí está en el programa. I, y, I don't remember eh, that well, the name. Leila Noriega speaking. de Aymara de And Leila Noriega, de Arica. Which, Así que pueblo de Aymara Así que from Arica eso, los invitamos a las tres para hacer so discusión. Y más tarde la discusión interna a la at Five, that it's an internal debate round ah, sí, bueno, la Janina es Mapuche, perdón. Eliseo, ¿es posible tener contactarte de nuestro fondo si estamos muy interesados en poder conversar contigo? ¿Será posible sí, contactarte? Encantado. Sí, encantado. Fantástico. Gracias. A, a ver si gracias nos puede, podemos conseguir tu, tu, tu correo para, 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 para coordinarnos. 